closure. I guess that's where I parted company with him because it, it really is something important. It's something uh, uh, of great gravity, and you don't solve that with a few bucks. That's what we got yesterday with the letter. I, I didn't think of this in terms of reparations. I, I thought of it in terms of, uh, you know, money being asked to do what money can't do. Um, no matter what's said, it'll be too little, it'll be too late. Uh, dollars? You know, how do you take a subject that serious and translate it into dollars? Who do you pay? I don't know. I have a radical solution for you. What happens if you put an ad in the newspaper saying that all the descendants of the African Americans that were expelled, thrown out of Pierce City, we will give you your land back. Please come here, because we would like to create a vibrant, diverse community. Uh, it is a radical solution. It's an interesting solution, and it makes sense uh, uh, late at night, about 3 in the morning, uh, when people are just getting together and talking and not paying too much attention to who they and we and uh, property and how all that actually gets done. Uh, who do we take that away from? I, I saw the letter that he sent to the mayor. And uh, uh, I think that, I don't think there's any amount of money that'll ever change the heartache that was caused in 19, what was it, 1901 and 1901. I, I, I think you could take millions and millions of dollars and it wouldn't change anything. It still would have the same hurt. But what else can be done about it? I mean, as I said, bearing the expenses of it, don't, I don't know, I don't know. And how do you fix it? I mean, there's no way to fix it. There's no way to fix it the things that was written in the St. Louis paper. I don't know what the answer is. One of the things that's really important is for black people to be able to have a way, an arena in which they can articulate what reparation would mean to them, even if it's only a fantasy that cannot be actualized. I think on the white end, whenever you feel either personal guilt or cultural guilt, reconciliation can't really happen unless you feel like you gave something that had meaning. You have to feel that you gave and that it actually gave the person something. Not that you imagine it erased everything, but that it really helped. The failure of Pierce City compels me to look for other solutions, for something else that might help. In the all-white town of Harrison, Arkansas, a group of citizens has created a task force to address their racial legacy. What we've done in Harrison, Arkansas, has been voluntary repentance. Nobody forced us to. Uh, and also the, the type of uh, reconciliation we've tried to do has been meet people where their needs are, rather than just a blanket statement for, for those that, uh, uh, who may have been involved or not involved. It's, it's just it's such a broad thing to do reparations. It's like, who do you punish? I mean, it is a lawsuit. It is. You know, they call it awarding damages to, to people who were wronged or descendants of wrong. Thank you, this one. All right, let's pray, and then let's just go right into praise and worship. I've uh, been living in Harrison about 11 years. Came here by way of Wimberley, Texas. If you just moved to Harrison, there was nothing in the community to throw any alarms or red flags. And it's just a nice, quiet little town, and then this article came out, and uh, 
for me, that was the first time I ever discovered any of the history of Harrison. I went to work on the 1st of November. A team from a junior high school in Fayetteville had played ball in Harrison. A parent who traveled with the team had been very distressed by the, the treatment he felt the kids had gotten. We had a very gifted athlete that was black, and he was subject to racial slurs the whole night. After the game was over, they refused to shake her hands. So we left the field, went to buy the kids a meal before they traveled back to Fayetteville. It was Halloween, and somebody had come in in a ghost suit to get a free Sunday, and the kid had thought it was, it was the Klan. The black boy, you know, looked up, was, or looked, you know, was just, just mortified, scared to death. You know, I saw fear, horror in his eyes. He ran off to the bathroom. I mean, here's a kid who comes over here. Every time he comes here, he's scared that the Klan's going to come and get him. I mean, that's terrible. I hate that. You know, that that's where that began to really gnaw at me. Eventually, I published a series of articles in the paper. People got pretty upset. And basically, what I heard was, we don't have any racial problem here. Right after I read this article, within two or three days, uh, the head of the Ku Klux Klan was on TV. He made this comment, I speak for, for white Christians in Harrison, Arkansas. And that just antagonized me to say, no, you don't. You don't speak for me. I began uh, looking to how do we solve this problem? We've got a community of 12,000 people almost no African-Americans, very little diversity, but it's been that way almost 100 years. How do you work with a, a race that's not there in your community? How do you make reconciliation with somebody who's no longer there? So we first started with ourselves. We started with a, an acknowledgement of what happened in 1905 and 1909. We had a symbolic washing of each other's feet before the community, and we said a prayer of repentance. So one of the things that we've done is an affirmation of wholeness that from this point forward, we're not going to allow these things to happen again. Recently, we just gave away a couple of scholarships, and I thought that was fitting that as 100 years later, where blacks were driven out of town, now there's a scholarship given to minority students to aid them in their college and their education to come to Harrison. So it's a quite a big reversal. We started out calling it the Aunt Vine Scholarship. Aunt Vine was the last black lady that stayed in Hurston. She didn't leave during the race riot, stayed with the family that um, she had been with for years. We read up her attributes and why we wanted to honor her, and it was a concrete example of what we wanted to connect with our past. Wow, she looks like my great-great-grandma. Well, how do you feel about this, this scholarship they gave you then? What do you mean, how do I feel? Well, you know, I mean, I, I understand that they think that the scholarship is a way that is helping them heal and change their image. I was really thought. I, I just thought that, for real, just to be real, like, I was like, well, they just trying to help us out because, you know, minority in Harrison have a scholarship, you know, for black, you know what I'm saying? It'll stand out, you know? And how would your folks feel about coming up? My mom, my mom was like, this it's a good opportunity. She worried about me, and more a lot of people worried about me, because they was like, you know, we don't want nothing to happen to you. I was scared, too. A scholarship is a wonderful thing and very important to seed into young people, but it's somehow over there. And it gives you the sense of your own magnanimity and a sense of your own generosity. And that's important for people to recognize that reparations is not a one-shot deal. It's a long-term commitment to re-identifying, to re-imagining um, what your community stands for. And so if you're not prepared to engage in that long-range project, then you may want to do a quick fix. The question then becomes, what is the appropriate means of addressing the harm here? As the research committee and began brainstorming some of the things that we want to... For the last year and a half, I've been involved in the task force for race relations. The reason that the task force was formed 
is that Harrison was a place where black Americans did not feel free to come, didn't feel comfortable spending the night. So it would not be difficult at all for people who are outside of the area to say this was a place where racial cleansing took place. It is a place where the Klan lives today and come to their own conclusions. If I moved uh, just over there across the way, would I be welcomed? I, I wouldn't be happy. Why? It's because I want to preserve our community, our culture. I think I have a heritage that is worth preserving. Burning many crosses these days? <laughs> it's a cross lighting. Excuse me, you're not burning crosses anymore? It's a cross lighting. It's an old Scottish symbol of a cross uh, embracing the fire of Christ. And uh, the Klan simply reenacts this uh, old uh, Scottish tradition. The burning cross, as I would call it, is used as a symbol of terror. You think you're being a little disingenuous when you say that a burning cross is not oh, yeah, used I agree. to terrorize it is. blacks in the American South. The Klan is an easy target for blame. But are they really the cause of the town's negative image or a symptom of it? People in town that I've spoken to in some ways say that you're the reason why Harrison has a negative reputation, that they, that everyone outside of Harrison has this uh, terrible um, impression of it as a place oh, they're that's lying. racist. They're lying. Tell me what you think the image well, of Harrison Well, I mean, Harrison has, has doubled in population since I moved here. Uh, Harrison listed, according to the Chamber of Commerce website for Harrison, Harrison listed as one of the top 100 places, best places to live in the country. It's a good community. A lot of people are moving here because it does reflect what they are as a people. So in some sense, you feel comfortable that you're speaking for the majority of the people? I would say the majority of white people in Harrison would not want minorities moving here. People have come here because of what it is not because of what they think it might be someday. Come on in here. OK. Talk to me a little bit about Harrison. Why did you come to Harrison? Why did I come to Harrison? For two reasons. Uh, the uh, low cost of living, the low cost of real estate, and uh, probably more importantly than anything else is lack of blacks. How'd you know that there were no blacks in Harrison? Because I'd been to Harrison many times visiting. I can give you probably 200 names of people who are retired here, and they tell me that the reason they chose to retire Tyron and Harrison was the exact same region I did. And I mean, they're, and they're uh, from all over the United States. If Bob Scott and Tom Robb are to be believed, Harrison has become a magnet for like-minded people to call home. At the Chamber of Commerce, the public face of the community, I wonder how they represent the town. We are not the same community that we were in 1905 and 1909. And even in those days, it was a small percent of the population that was involved in that. And so while we want to acknowledge that, acknowledge the hurt of that, we know that we have moved past that, and that's not the community that we are today. If you're an all-white community, mm -hmm. Maybe that says that if you're not white, you're not welcome. The idea of this racist enclave in the hills wasn't what we know ourselves to be today. My concern was if that's the image out there and that's what's being promoted and publicized about your community. I have something that confuses me. There are four flags hanging outside, mm -hmm. one of which is a Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that communicates that I am welcomed here mm -hmm in Harrison. The reasoning behind the flags 
is historical. They were put up to say, here is the five governments that have governed this particular area. And it's the Spanish flag, the French flag, the United States flag, and the Confederate flag, because that was all the different parts. It is not meant as a slap or a sign that says, you are not welcome here. If the flags honor Harrison's past, how can the town truly hope to make amends for the banishment of its African-American citizens? People who are on the task force for race relations are very concerned about Harrison's image in the outside world. How do we deal with this in a substantive way? And I think that that is, in fact, the work of the task force. I want to welcome all of you to the first meeting of the research committee. We are honored to have David Zimmerman with us. Welcome to our group. Thank you very much. This is a map of Harrison and marked in all the shaded lots are lots that at one time belonged to black people. Richard Fancher, Joseph Joslin, and George Harrison bought the AME church. William and Fanny Stinnett, whose son was hanged in 1909, lived right there. Robert Warren and his wife lived there. Elijah Armstrong and his wife and children lived there. Thomas Horton, who was a blacksmith and Aunt Vine's son, lived right there. Aunt Vine lived in a cabin behind the Wilson's house, which was on lots 15 and 17. To me, one of the ironic things about Harrison today is you can walk right to the place where Aunt Vine's house was, and it is in the middle of a public park. But there is nothing in those parks that indicates that a black person ever drew breath in this county much less lived and died here. My idea is you put up a marker on the square that says something like 250 yards east of here was the center of the African-American community of Harrison, Arkansas, which was destroyed in two separate episodes of white mob violence in 1905 and 1909. I think we agree with that statement, but I think it's gonna take much more because I think we've done that. We've said it through National Day, National Day of Prayer. We've mm -hmm. said it through uh, a, a very conscious link with uh, a, an AME church in yeah. Helena. Yeah. We have done it, but, but you're saying until we do it, something visible. I know that there are people who say, oh, this should be done, that should be done. But to me, the truth is the truth. And the day that you finally stand up in front of everyone and say, this is what happened, is the day that you're free from having to carry it around as a dark secret. And I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm saying it's going to take more than that, I think. Because I have a friend who, who was ministered down in a, a little bit south of here, and he said that his daughters would not spend the night in Harrison. And I said, why? What is, that? what is it that we can't overcome? His comment was, and I quote, it's Tom Robb. No, sir. The Klan is here because they're comfortable here. But I did locate the black... Permanent markers in the physical space. This is a critical part of reparations. That there has to be a way in which the communities themselves reflect the reality of what happened. You can go to communities all throughout the United States, and you'll see markers for various events that happened. But you'll n almost never see a marker that reflects the history of racial violence. Despite the town's efforts, which seem sincere, I can't help thinking, is the scholarship or a monument really enough? 1889, but no name. And when, when did you say Aunt Vine was, uh, When died? did she die? Yeah. 1914 or 1916. Listen. It's a small stone. An infant, maybe. Yeah, an infant, know. given that size. Born in 1647. Wow. Jones, Jones, Jones. 
Well, it's a great mystery to me that there's no record of where Vine was. Yeah, buried. under the circumstances that she was the last black to live in Harrison for any number of years. Aunt Vine, the last black person to live in Harrison, has a scholarship in her name, but no grave marker. This is the lingering legacy of the expulsion of black citizens. We remain invisible. I return to St. Louis. Did Charles succeed in getting Pierce City to pay for the reburial of his great-grandfather? Why is it so hard to find common ground? You know, when I first started making these rolls, I didn't know how to do it. And everybody in the neighborhood were guinea pigs. Everybody got to try some. While they were bad, once I got good at it, nobody gets any now. <laughs> <laughs> so where are things? The mayor put an article in the Pierce City paper. He did not respect me enough to write me or call me or want to dialogue with me. Uh, I'll just read you just a couple lines of what the mayor says. Dear Mr. Brown, I hope you won't mind that I've taken a few days to think about your letter before replying. After all, yours was a serious letter about the most serious of subjects, and I wanted to make sure I did full justice to you and your family's concern. Now, this is a letter in the newspaper. I did also say that I was sorry you asked to be paid, because I think the shock and outrage you write you rightfully feel at the events of 1901, which I think any civilized person shares, are only diminished by the suggestion that somehow someone can just open a checkbook in 205. Well, I didn't say just open a checkbook. I said reimburse us for what we put out, and I will come down there and stand before the town and vindicate the town and say this is not a town of 1901. And I told Don, who was the undertaker in charge, who was also the coroner for the area, I told him that I will pay him in a timely manner based on what happens with everything, the fallout from all of this. Well, I got a, a phone call telling me that I was a crook, that I was trying to not pay Don, and that I was trying to uh, hold the city hostage. So I immediately went and got a, a cashier's check for the amount that Don wanted, and I paid him. Excuse me a minute. Help me understand why you didn't let anybody know that these were your intentions or desires to begin with, to have them at the very least reimburse you for your costs as a way to bring about healing. I didn't trust them. And the reason I didn't trust them because of the fact that they wanted to hide all this in the past. What did you put on the gravestone? We haven't put a gravestone there yet. We're still waiting. What am I waiting for? I don't know. I guess maybe I'm hoping that Pierce City will come to me and say, we need to address that tombstone. And that way, then they would help us in the healing process. I leave Charles to attend the Strickland's family reunion. Perhaps they found a resolution to the loss of their stolen family land. Look at your grandmommy. Oh, mom, that look like me. <laughs> He's the fifth generation. <laughs> He's the fifth generation. Uh, Fire, would you like to hear this? Excuse me, Miss McCain. I want to tell you about a project that we were working on. Several of us got together, and we were had done some research at the Forsyth County Courthouse on some of the property that involved our family. And we're not sure if it's fraud, but we just wanted to share it with you so that you would be aware of it, OK? 
we have researched the titles as far as we can go without legal assistance. Some of the family members feel that they want to pursue it further, and I had said that this would not be a decision made at the family reunion because it would be an emotional decision, and what does it mean if they find out that there's fraud? Yes. And if any money swaps hands, none of us will live to see it. My child will not be living to see it, and my child's children will probably not be living to see it. If we really follow this, you know, it could have a definitive end of some wrongdoing and some of the property was taken unjustly. And we, you know, you can maybe be, be documented that that was true. It would be good for me to have just a definitive answer. In the formal legal sense, the time had passed for them to, to bring to court a claim for the expulsion. Our conclusion was that the litigation prospects were not good. But when those violations have happened on such a grand scale, you have to, if you're going to be fair about it, acknowledge that they only happened because it was allowed by the greater society. The issue goes well beyond a legal question. The time has run out for anybody to come forward and say, I have legal claim to this land. But it's a question of some things that the law doesn't address, which is what is right, what is just. And it's our sen sense of rightness, it's our sense of justice that uh, I think uh, comes into play here. Okay, that black-owned land was indeed appropriated by the whites. These black landowners were victimized, and they deserve the compensation. Banishment causes losses of all sorts. There is loss of opportunity to interact with folks who have been banished. There's loss of community. And those things are very hard to get back. And I think that's one of the things that the reparations movement promises. It holds out the promise of reconstruction of the African-American community reconstruction of the morality of the white community. Reconstruction of the entire American community.